year after year after year getting that's a laugh line by the way in 2016 getting in front of the microphone in front of 600 people saying when are you guys going to ban natural gas it's only four years away and the whole crowd erupts in laughter at the absurdity of your question <laughs> okay so after that and i've got a strong will being a nerd i've been laughed at my whole life and so i'm like i can handle laughter because i'm right <laughs> that's the first stage of being right is they laugh at you i've heard that This is the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. Revitalizing the world together. Welcome to the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. This is your host, Neil Collins. It is a show that is supported by our work at Latitude Realty. In it, we explore our natural and built environments and how they can be used as a force for good. The show sets out to inspire impactful ideas, meaningful change, human wellness, and ecological restoration through interviews and easy to digest conversations. Our guests range from industry leaders to iconoclasts, from both well-known figures to everyday people leading extraordinary lives. This is a show for people looking for education and inspiration on how real estate can be done differently. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another podcast episode of the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. I'm very excited. Long overdue here. Uh, we had a delay at the beginning, but glad to, to have you on. We have Sean Armstrong with Redwood Energy. Sean, thanks so much hey. for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. Totally appreciate it. Glad to be here. Sean, let's let's first introduce you to to the audience of where you physically are as we record this city, state, uh, tiny house. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in Arcata, California, which is the college town of Humboldt State University, which has one of the oldest and most significant environmental engineering programs in the country. It recently became the third polytechnical university in California, and just in the process of doing its name change. So um, that's where I went to college back in 1995 and started studying at this demonstration house on campus that the environmental engineering program is a part of, but it's really owned by the students and the students fund it and the students lead it in the sense there's no oversight staff person. So you have your own house and 10 to 20 staff people for a year as a co-director and you live in it. So very transformative experience, um, still involved in that organization, that house. So. Here, this house, this is built by one of the, this is a tiny house, 100 square feet. It's called the Barnacle and it's attached to our barn. It's got a living roof up above it, which uh, connects both the barn and this little Barnacle. And it was built by one of the co-directors of CCAT, that demonstration house up on campus, Campus Center for Appropriate Technology. So everything in here um, is an effort to be regenerative. You know, the wood that's on the ceiling here, this is from the community forest um, about a mile from where I'm standing and it's blued pine. So it's a fungal infected pine. Turns it a little bit blue, but doesn't do any structural damage, just makes it pretty. Um, so like recycled barn wood behind me from the, the founder of the kinetic sculpture race, this insane three day long pedal powered, goes through the dunes, the bay, screaming down the roads through like a river all of it you have to do this all on a bicycle powered piece of art so the founder of that when he passed his his uh, studio was taken down and we got some of the wood in here and there's wool behind the walls from our own sheep and uh, that means actually i live in a, a moth house because the walls are constantly having little um hatchings of moths and so they'll flutter around me. And I always wanted as a, as a kid to live in a tropical rainforest dome with one of those butterfly houses where there's like butterflies that land on your fingers. It's kind of like that. It's sort of like the barn version. <laughs> and they eat your rugs. <laughs> they eat my rugs and I have to keep things in cedar chests. But uh, yeah, I've had to sort of embrace what it means to live attached to a barn. My I friend. love the name Barnacle. How fun. I, and Arcata is just one of those iconic places where the redwoods meet the sea i i get where your name redwood energy comes from <laughs> yeah it, um i came here to be a redwood forest activist in 1995 when the timber wars were a real thing and earth first humboldt county which was 
founded in that demonstration house once again in 1986. So I came out here from Wisconsin because of the Redwoods to try to stop um, an illegal cutting operation that had been going on for a number of years, a lawless, illegal old growth redwood cutting, which did stop um, in 1998, I think is when the federal government stepped in. So yeah, I was really inspired by Julia Butterfly. She spent two years up in a tree um, protecting a 50 acre grove successfully. Wow. And uh, so when she came down after two years that the grove had been protected, it was an old growth redwood grove. It wasn't supposed to have been cut down, but that's how things were rolling up here. It was kind of a war and one side had all the chainsaws. So um, yeah, I, I just wanted to name our place after the kind of energy that um, had founded my career in environmentalism. Mm, yeah, and I know that uh, not to like go into this too quick, but there was uh, a lot of talk about fire, forest fires this year in the Redwoods. And yeah. should we protect them? Have they, you know, there's, there's a couple of different sides of that story uh, to forest fires with the Redwoods, but were you in the, the path of, of the destruction? Well, um, you know, the Redwoods go all the way down to Santa Cruz. So as climate change aridifies the West and heats things up, um, we're going to see a natural move of the redwoods, and they're not going to be able to grow um, south of San Francisco. But I'm about six hours north of San Francisco, so it's still pretty cool and wet up here. And the fires, um, which are inland, about uh, about 50 miles away, is where the fires will come. They don't burn a whole lot further because the forests on the coast are still pretty cool and wet. And redwood specifically has a fire preventative bark. And when fires start, they can exude red sap. It looks like they're bleeding. And they can try to stop the fires on themselves. They're really an amazing, like 120 million year old tree that does amazing things, like fuses the roots of all the trees nearby and then communicates with actual messages from one tree to the next through their nervous systems. They have a nervous system that's about as fast as the slugs, but they can talk <laughs> and they can release chemicals. And, and so you'll see like one tree being cut down over there and the trees all nearby will start exuding red sap to try to stop what they perceive as some big damaging event that's about to happen to them. Wow, I, we're driving um, during the height of the pandemic in 2020 uh, from uh, Oregon into California. And I was reading the book, The Overstory at the same uh -huh. time, which was just incredible. The, that rich kind of scientific meets um, activism meets just such a gripping narrative of, of prose about the, the secret life of trees and everything that comes with it. Yeah, the secret life of trees. I've been digging into that for a long time, studying fire ecology, doing canopy biology classes, actually got to go climb up into the trees, you know, 50, 100 feet. It's terrifying. I was the worst student, so I had a phobia of going up that high. <laughs> I just wouldn't learn the knots. <laughs> just keep me on the ground, please. I nearly wet myself going up that high the first time. Woo! Um, those trees are tall. They're crazy. Like I'm a Midwestern. I climbed trees that were 30 feet tall. Once I got up to 50 feet, it was the highest it had ever been in a tree. And that was the beginning. It was literally the first branch. <laughs> it was at 50 feet tall. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, the, I think that this place is inspiring. It's brought so many people here. It's one of the last vestiges of true old growth forest in North America. There's, there's some amazing boreal forest when you get up into Canada. So maybe I would say in the United States, mm -hmm. but that is the caveat. You know, there's a little bit that's just in like this thin rind on the Pacific Ocean. But like in Wisconsin, where I'm from, you really can't find an old growth forest. You can find maybe a graveyard with a big old oak tree in it, but not a forest. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, this place is amazing. To get a sense of what like a mul many, 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 many thousands year old forest looks and feels like. It's not like a normal, like woods that you walk through that's been cut over 20 times since, you know, 1600 or something. And I'm glad we're having this, this conversation about forest ecology and, and trees and just this spectacular um, heritage that we have, living heritage all around us, especially framing the conversation from two real estate professionals, one, one being a zero net designer and another uh, much more on the transactional side of just how everything is linked together and where it, it, 
is clear that you're drawing inspiration from. Yeah, I mean, trying to to make really green housing. You know, I went from being a radical forest activist and act, to working for the largest general contractor in the area and had this crazy experience the first summer where the Redwood Grove next to the demonstration house up on campus was being cut down illegally with a totally illegal the way it was being done. And it was my business that was there. And I went to the job site in a Danco job truck and protested them and had to be escorted out by the police. And they still didn't fire me, which is to this day, I'm so impressed by this conservative Republican boss of mine who deeply believed in free speech. And who just looked at me so perplexed to like, how do I deal with you, dude? And it's like, just don't do that again. Like, <laughs> and, and we continued on and we built this amazingly profitable business now of doing 100% solar powered, all electric, affordable housing, which that general contractor transitioned from being you know, the kind that work on public works locally, maybe build a little bit of a road, do some small subdivisions, a very um, like, you know, generalist, general contractor and developer, to the exclusively affordable housing that is 100% solar powered because it makes the most money. They're simply the most profitable by doing that and they're 100% they're money oriented. And I, and I appreciate them for that, actually, because if you are 100% money oriented, then you'll discover like, hey, cheap electricity, the cheapest is from solar. And it's less expensive to build when you're building all electric. It's both faster, less infrastructure going in. And the appliances are a little bit cheaper than the gas equivalents. It's only like $100 on the stove or $100 on the dryer. But it can be a few thousand dollars on HVAC. And it's pretty much cost neutral in domestic hot water. So it's, it's one of those things where it goes a little faster and it's a little bit easier in design. And maybe it saves a little bit of money, but you get access to the cheapest solar power when you make it all electric. So this this knowledge that I was able to bring to them as the only college educated member of a large staff, you know, everyone else is high school. And, um, and so they kind of looked at me as that like useful nerd, you know, <laughs> and, and that's all I ever wanted to be in my life. I'm totally a nerd, just, just, you know, useful. That'd be helpful. You know? Well, Sean, so you, you graduate from Humboldt state. Yep. What, was it in architecture? Was it in engineering? What, what's your academic? Um... Oh, I had like three or four degrees going through college. I was interested in everything. So the through line you'd find is I took building science classes. I was a co-director and staff up at that demonstration house. So I built things. I took the classes. I learned how to build. I did the thing I built. And then I had a mentor who was a residential designer, not a, a formal architect, but she designed. And she uh, saw that I was really into design and green building like her. And so she mentored me and I got that job at Danco through her as, as like a junior project manager when they were growing quickly. And then during the recession, when they were firing everyone that they'd hired, you know, the staff went from 50 down to nine in the office and I was the ninth. And when they let me go, it was really reluctantly because we'd just gotten a whole bunch of grants, but they were about to shut the doors. And so it was 2010. Wow. And they, they let me go. And I worked briefly for the city of Arcata, developing a zero net energy homeless housing development. Got fired because I was protesting. <laughs> this is another through line. When people are doing really bad stuff, I, I put myself out there and say, stop that. You know, that what you're doing is literally illegal. You could do some legal stuff. I'm in favor of legal development. I'm not in favor of illegal development. That's not cool. And people who do it legally, spend a lot of money and energy and time to do it right. And so if, as an example, when your developer, my boss, when he hid an underground storage tank illegally in his um, garage that he'd found while doing a development, you're supposed to report those. You're supposed to clean out the hole. You're supposed to test the hole to make sure that there's no gas left over. You're not supposed to dig it out and hide it in your garage so that no one knows you have to do all this regulatory work. And that was the kind of thing I was like, look, if I'm working here, then I'm going to take care of all of your underground storage tanks. But if you're going to be in charge of it, then I'm leaving today. <laughs> because that's, and, and that's the kind of standards I hold for all businesses, period. Just, you know, it's not fair if you do it wrong and everyone else who does it right has to pay the money and go through the effort and you know, get to hold their head high having done the right thing when they went home. So I'm, I'm in favor of that. So anyway, yeah, I got let go from the city of Arcata. I did get that homeless housing project done. 
and I joined uh, forces with a fellow activist. I'd met him, um, he's, he's 20 years older than I am. And he, uh, actually almost 30, uh, but he doesn't like to talk about his age. <laughs> so anyway, he, uh, I, I met him when he was clandestinely changing the light bulbs in the hallways at our apartment complex. The owners hadn't given him permission. So he just went out there and he's like six foot five or something. And he's just reaching up, personally replacing all the light bulbs in the hallways. <laughs> This is my kind of guy, you know, harmless, sweet and harmless and doing the right thing. And just being helpful, paid for the light bulbs themselves, you know, putting in CFLs. So um, yeah, about a decade later, uh, we, we joined forces. You know, he was a very successful engineer in his life. He was the person who was a technical lead on the world's first cell phone system for Motorola in Vienna. Wow. And that was back in like 79. So he said, he set up all the substations so that the phones could communicate through the city. Smart guy. So yeah, the two of us, we, uh, we're both ardent um, climate change activists, environmental preservationists who wanted to work in development in the world where things are happening to help people profit off of doing great buildings. Yeah, we were on the and same page. And how, how did you vision that work was gonna show up through, um, through well, what, what aspect? I, what we'd seen is that solar energy was dropping in price dramatically. You know, when I was working in solar in 1999, the price was five to seven dollars a watt. Right now, it's 15 cents a watt. So that price decline of like 85 to 90 percent that we've seen over the last 10 years, that was picking up speed when we started our business. We were seeing prices drop quickly. And there were incentives, new solar homes program. There's tax credits at the federal government level. And let's give credit to bipartisan um, cooperation. In 2007, Bush signed our last truly bipartisan Energy Independence Act, the Energy Independence Act. And that had money both for renewable energy and for uh, fossil fuel exploration, hmm. for both. It had policies in it saying, you know, by 2020, we want all federal buildings to be zero net energy. Um, and that, actually was echoing what had happened in California the previous year in which in 2006, Arnold Schwarzenegger, a Republican, working with the Democrats, signed a 2020 goal for zero net energy houses in California. So those things were paired. We were starting to see, um, we're in rural areas, right? And I, I was working for a rural developer. The USDA's Rural Development Division took that language from the Energy Independence Act and said, we're gonna give top scoring to zero net energy projects, low income families, low income seniors, low income farm workers, that's what they funded. So our projects could compete, we could win. We could win millions of dollars if we promised zero net energy and it was demonstrably the most profitable way to develop if we did it the way that we like discovered over a few years and in, in from 2005 to 2008. And said, oh my, um, so when we went out and started consulting, we we're just showing people like, this is the goose that lays the golden egg. This is amazing. This is going to make you money year after year. It is the only way I can think of to make your business more profitable doing green building as opposed to spending money that goes away. So uh, just try to try to stay in that vein ever since for 10 years is consulting with affordable housing developers frequently had some incentive to do zero net energy. So they'd look at it seriously, might blow you off and say, I just don't even believe you that this is going to be a more proper way. You hear that a lot. But yeah. if they have an incentive to at least investigate, then we can do the financial spreadsheet with them and show uh, what it looks like over 15 years. Because solar pays for itself in six years. They have to own the buildings for 15 years by law. And that's unusual for developers. But once you no longer worry about the split incentive of you installing solar, but someone else getting the benefit, you know, you put the money up front and it was whatever amount, $9,000 more per apartment to do at zero net energy. If you have to own the building and you can get a subsidized loan to cover it, which you usually can in affordable housing and there's additional incentives and such, then yeah, if you, if you, if you spend the time looking at the spreadsheet, then all of a sudden it makes a ton of sense. Basically we, we help each development make about $1 million more on average. So if it's a $20 million project, we're bringing in about a million dollars of additional financial benefit. That builds on average, we have a 65 unit average apartment complex from like 
we study like 50 of our apartment complexes. We've done uh, 150 or something. So the, we studied these 50 and we found that it was 65 apartments and of the 65, um, it was five of them that had been built by the benefits of solar power. Like that was the money that came in over the 15 years is that it, it because when you, um, you do your perm loan, it's called the permanent loan at the end of construction is based upon the rents and the revenue that's coming in. And the way this works, solar power essentially increases the rent. So they can go in and say, I can collect more rent off these zero net energy apartments and the rent then turns into a larger loan. And that can turn into profit coming at them faster. They get their money back faster because uh, they often have to like delay profits for seven years and such. So if you, you show like, hey, this is gonna make more revenue cash flow better. You're gonna get your profit margin out of this sooner. Everyone's happy. Um, yeah, I'll Let pause there. Hey everybody, this is Neil. We are gonna get back to this great conversation in just one second. But I think it's fair to say that right now, we are facing some pretty unprecedented challenges in the 21st century. I mean, you name it, environmentally, socially, economically, we've got some big problems that we need to overcome. And that's why for me personally, and the people that work with us at Latitude, we want to dedicate our time and our energy so that we are not only working to put food on the table and a roof over our heads, but also make the world a better place. And so if you are at all interested in combining your sustainability values with a very powerful financial model of real estate, then I highly encourage you to check out what we are doing at Latitude. We are creating something truly special with a tribe of change agents that for now is working across North America. And hopefully one day in the future with you coming on board, we can be working across the globe. So please check us out. You can go to www.chooselatitude.com or you can find us on social media at latitude.realty on Instagram. And we are also on Facebook. Okay, let's get back into it. Let's uh, let's define some terms here, Sean, because you yeah. you're, you're saying uh, zero net, affordable, uh, multifamily apartment complexes, and so let, let's first focus on the, the beginning of that. The zero net. How does that compare to uh, what you hear a lot of net zero versus zero net? Is there a difference? Oh. Uh, yeah, it's the Canadians versus the Americans. The Can Canadians they they call Z Z, and so they hate saying Z net energy. <laughs> <laughs> or Z -N -E, Z N E, so they insisted that it be net zero energy if you're in Canada, and in the United States we call it Z N E as opposed to N Z E up there. That's all. That's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so zero net, <laughs> zero net, or net We're zero. On affordable housing uh, complexes. You said average of sixty five units, and it, yep. that is combining public with private uh, models. Yeah. And, how they're going about it? It's a, it's a big insight in 1987 that the HUD model of funding affordable housing, 100%, federal government owns the buildings, that that was not leveraging enough money. Like they just couldn't build affordable housing enough only using their own money. And I think we can all acknowledge there's things that government does well and things that government does less well. There's things that private markets do well and private markets do less well. And so the tax credits, which are distributed by the IRS, are now the number one way that we develop affordable housing in the country, in which the tax credits subsidize, kind of disappear about a third of the cost of the development. And in return, the rents have to be discounted at least, at least 10%, but it's supposed to be 20 to 25%. That's generally where you see it, compared to the market rate for the exact same apartments. And you have to do a big market study to make sure you're pricing your rents correctly. So the other two thirds comes from um, a Community Reinvestment Act that requires the banks to loan into affordable housing. So you get a discounted loan and then the developer themselves have to put in money. Essentially, they have to take out personal loans. And, um, and also they do a lot of upfront development costs that are um, speculative. You, know, you might spend 50,000 to $500,000 just getting a project ready for funding applications if you have to do you know, environmental remediation of an old mill site or an old parking lot or things like that. Um, like I mentioned, I got pretty specialized in doing that. So we could go to cheap old land. 
turn it into something awesome. Yeah, so that's what affordable housing is. It's partially subsidized by the federal government via the IRS. And sometimes there's little bits of money like the USDA rural development or a little bit of HUD Section 8 housing vouchers or a little bit of veteran housing vouchers or, or mental disability uh, vouchers. A whole bunch of different vouchers are out there that can also chip in. John, how do you think this this compares that like saying that you can make the bottom line so much more profitable by doing zero net affordable housing, but how does that compare if, if, if developers are, are not looking at the affordability route, uh, mm -hmm. but they you might be uh, selling it right away. In other words, like they're like production housing developers. Or just I, why is it so anathema that everybody says, well, green building just costs more? Well, because um, I guess let's break it down. All electric construction doesn't cost more. Four in 10 homes in the United States are built in the American South. And the American South is building 80% all electric now. So this, this is what really smart, savvy developers who are ruthless about making money, this is what they do. In the South, they make all electric housing because they don't have to build infrastructure that they don't need. Um, so all electric, that makes a ton of sense, demonstrably so. And, and it's like a quiet revolution happening all over the country. In almost every county in the United States, all electric construction has been growing since 1993 as the market share growth. And there was only a 20 year gap from 73 to 93 in which that wasn't the case. Up until 73, also for the previous 70 years or so, electrification of appliances and space heating and domestic hot water had been growing. And that's why since 1950, the plurality of water heaters have been electric. And then since 1970, the plurality, plurality of new um, space heating systems have been electric. And that's why 61% of our, our ranges in the country stoves are electric. And like 88% of our dryers are electric. It's just easier to put in to plug it in than to, to plumb gas, which is the most expensive trade. So that's, all electric makes sense. Solar power, the clean energy source, that has upfront costs that you have to figure out how to finance. So, you know, we have this affordable housing situation where the owner can't sell it for 15 years. And so they get tons of revenue and benefits from putting in solar. But when you're doing be it condos or homes or commercial buildings that are gonna get leased out spaces that you can put solar to, then you have to figure out how to price the rent correctly or price the sales price. Like either way, you have to somehow solve the split incentive and get the money back, knowing that it's a good investment, but it's just like, but how do you get it back? So there's a, a bunch of real estate studies now that have been done showing that solar maintains its value that even over years, people will recognize its value and there's real estate classes you can take. So you can sort of glance up at the roof, count the panels, that kind of thing to, and there's three different strategies, you know, like revenue, you can go get the utility bills versus the asset and just say like, what is the comp for the asset? There's, there's multiple ways to price solar so that, because people want it. I mean, it, that's really, it's fun to interview people who are moving into affordable housing has, that's a zero net energy project because they're just convinced that this is a luxury thing that they're getting. You know, this is, a, this is awesome. I thought I was just moving into an apartment, but it's a solar powered apartment. Where's my Tesla, you know? So the, the people want it. You just have to figure out how to sell it. And, um, and in California now, the code requires that all production homes, single family homes since 2019 have to have about two thirds offset solar array. You have to offset everything except the water heater and, and the, the, the space heating system, but everything else, even if it's gas, like the stove and the dryer has to have a solar array compensating for it and then all the plug loads. So this is an issue that everyone has to face. Uh, the next code, um, the 2022 code that starts in 2023, January 1st, that one requires solar in all building types, all of it. So you just, you have to figure out how to sell. And since people want it, it's really kind of on you as a salesperson, come on here. You know, if you can sell a granite countertop, you can sell the solar, array. Right? People know what they are, they like them. Um, so that's the, the nut of it, is to get good at selling the, the thing that people want, the valuable thing. Uh, I, 
you know, that's that was the gap and the opportunity that we really saw uh, from the sales side of the industry. The quote unquote professionals that have been doing this for a long time would would try to convince you that solar is not worth the investment. The roof is probably going to be leaking. Oh, you got to watch out for the types of leases or it just doesn't contribute any value to the property. Yeah, and I remember the- like objecting to cell phones like that in 2001. I'm like, I like my home handset. It's great. What is this cell phone? It's so expensive. Who's going to use this thing? Right? Yeah. Okay. So people can resist change, including me, foolishly, you know, just ignorant of really how radically the world is going to change. But it's just the fact solar is the cheapest form of energy you can buy. It's the cheapest way to get your, your kilowatt hours. So like cell phones, it's a fact. Those things are on their way. <laughs> it's just people like them. <laughs> that and so the policy that that you brought up, this is this is really interesting because we are mandated. Oh, and let me roll back some of this so I don't get in trouble with our trade associations here. Uh, but let's just say that there are some very powerful trade associations that deal with transactional real estate and building of houses that are. Um, it seems like they are obfuscating the issue of we are the clean energy sector by putting in natural gas or we can do all these offsets and capture capture gas from farms and uh, and other carbon carbon type um, projects that they're touting and so that's it seems like there's a lot of pushback on going all electric from that this is one of those things that like, you know, let's put ourselves back in 1910 when almost everyone has a wood burning stove and someone offers you coal. And you're like, awesome. This stuff is way more energy dense. It's totally burns hotter. I can just throw a little bit in there. It's easier to start. Yeah, yeah. fuels have a, um, have a context in which they made sense. So in 2001, when the solar industry was young, it didn't make sense, natural gas was cheaper, but it was never cleaner. Like it is, there's just no such thing as burning something and having that be clean. Natural gas is made out of methane, plus like 15% other little gases in there. The methane, when you burn that in your house, it creates formaldehyde. It's the number one source of formaldehyde in your house. That stuff is dangerous. It produces, like I had twins prematurely and only many years later did I discover that the premature birth of my twins, which was totally traumatic and difficult, you know, having three pound babies come out and they're fine, but it was, it was rough. And that might've been because we were using our gas stove to heat our tiny apartment. Like my wife would come in from the farm, she'd be sopping wet in the winter time and she'd open up the oven and warm herself up while pregnant. And that is exactly, that is you might as well be begging for a premature birth to be inhaling that much nitrogen dioxide which triggers premature births. So, I, you know, there's a context where things made sense that is not any longer. Solar power is cheaper, all electric construction is cheaper, and, and it was, natural gas is never cleaner. Coal is never cleaner. It was just less expensive and made sense, you know, to a certain way of looking at it. But that was then. People, you know, like that, that, that stopped being a relevant thing to talk about in maybe 2009 or 2010 to say natural gas is the bridge fuel that we need to a cleaner future. That's, that's malarkey to quote a certain president. <laughs> and so where do you see, uh, I know, was it Berkeley that's passed no new gas um, in, in new developments? Uh, oh, I, can I tell you a story? That's my yeah, favorite please story. Do. <laughs> so, uh, Going from what you were just saying, uh, since 2011, when we started making profitable zero to energy apartment complexes come out, I've been going to the Energy Commission at their meetings, at their public forums, et cetera, and saying, when are you guys gonna ban natural gas? This is not a cost-effective strategy. We already have our laws saying by 2020, we're gonna have a zero to energy house. How are you pulling that off when you have natural gas in there? You can't invent natural gas in most people's homes and solar electricity doesn't offset gas. Those are not even apples and oranges, it's elephants and fish. So how are you gonna do that? Year after year after year, getting, that's a laugh line, by the way, in 2016, getting in front of the microphone in front of 600 people saying, when are you guys gonna ban natural gas? It's only four years away. And the whole crowd erupts in laughter at the absurdity of your question. (laughs) 
okay, so after that, and I've got a strong will. Being a nerd, I've been laughed at my whole life. And so I'm like, I can handle laughter because I'm right. <laughs> That's the first stage of being right is they laugh at you. I've heard that. Um, so seeing that, that the cost effective choice wasn't even being considered, even though we have a Title 24 law, the Warren Alquist Act, which Ronald Reagan signed into law that requires cost effective codes. We couldn't get a cost effective code out of California, even with the law saying 2020. So with that kind of outrageous bad policy making that doesn't help anyone who's in business, um, I lost it. I got so pissed that I did something never done before is I hired a lawyer. <laughs> and I hate lawyers. I mean, I love lawyers. Lawyers are totally nice people. I hate the legal profession and some of the, the sheer amount of grinding, expensive argumentation that goes on. But I hired the, the, be, the lead lawyers in the state of California who worked for all the cities, Shoot Mahaley and Weinberger, doing all their CEQA documents, all of their, all their legal stuff, all of it. And I said, You're the, tell me how to do this. Tell me how a city can ban natural gas. Because uh, my partner, Michael, he's the mayor of Arcata and he's already gotten his city council members in 2018, so all five of them to agree that they should try to ban natural gas in this itty bitty little college town, the first municipality in the United States to take such a vote. And the, the shoot Mahaley Weinberg came back with uh, like three or four different ways. You could do it through the energy code called the reach code. You could do it through the building code because California, which already has required fire sprinklers for decades now, um, they'd already been sued over the fire sprinklers. Do you guys have regulatory authority through a municipality or a county to require new plumbing fire sprinklers? Yes, 100%. For fire, it, like building codes exist for safety. That's what they're for. So does the city have the ability to not allow gas piping to go through the walls? Because it's super dangerous. Homes blow up all the time in California. You know, in Ohio, a few years back, there were 400 and something times construction workers hit gas pipes. It's just, it's like the odds are always there. Someone's gonna hit it, yes. Someone's gonna hit it when it's live and there's a spark and they're gonna die and the whole building's gonna blow up in little pieces. I have lots of YouTube clips of firefighters showing up and being blown up, like just being blown back, having stuff hit them in the face, all sorts of awful things, because you know they, they run into danger and it's really dangerous having natural gas in a house or any building, demonstrably so. Um, so that was how uh, Berkeley arrived sort of there. We, we, we delivered a legal opinion to everyone um, in 2019, Berkeley held an electrification exposition because people were starting to talk about how we should learn how to do electrification of buildings. And I gave them a barnstormer for two hours. You know, I was up there, they, they wanted that. I did two hours, <laughs> two different presentations, but pretty much everyone just stayed in this huge sweaty room getting jazzed on like this, it's this dangerous. It's, this causes problems with your births and your babies. It's you know, this, da, 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 go all the reasons. It's cheaper for Christ's sake, pardon me. It's just cheaper. So they, uh, they moved on it. I mean, it's Berkeley. And you know, they're one of the first cities to ban cigarettes inside. They're, they're historically, you know, it's been a, a birthplace of civil rights activism, you know, at least West Coast style. Mm -hmm. And that has now been followed by 51 other cities, not just Berkeley. Berkeley, San Francisco, Oakland, pretty much every city that you know the name of and lots that you don't in the Bay Area, because the Bay Area is full of itty bitty little cities, but the whole Silicon Valley, all the little cities of Silicon Valley, San Jose, 10th largest city in the country. And then it's moved down the coast and a little bit inland, but we're all like the, the movement's already down in San Diego area. So Solana Beach, Encinitas, Carlsbad, um, San Diego just had a a political change in its city council. And so they have been moving towards their electrification ban or gas ban, electrification ordinance. Sacramento, state capital, already did it. Um, so 2023 for them is when you can no longer put gas into low rise buildings. And I think 2026 is when it's impossible in high rise. And then it's been moving nationwide. So Bellingham, uh, Seattle, Honolulu, Denver, um, some of the, the suburbs around Boston, Austin, Texas, uh, and like little small places like Cross Plains, Wisconsin, next to Madison. Um, 
that's where the movement's been going. It's at the municipal level. We have not succeeded in getting any state to take the kind of action that's necessary to address climate change. And also, once again, lower construction costs, speed up construction, give people higher quality experiences because all electric is a quieter house. You know, the ductwork doesn't blow as hard when you're using heat pump as it does with the gas furnace. It doesn't turn on and off the way the gas furnaces do to kind of wake you up in the middle of the night with the fan turning on. You know, they're safer induction stoves. You can let your little kids play on them because they don't, they don't have flames and they're not even hot. It's only the pan that gets hot. It's not like a coil underneath that gets hot and there's no fumes off of them. So it, it's been moving. Each city has had its own rationale, its own set of activists, its own compromises with local factions, you know, be it like this hospital, they don't, they're powerful and they don't want to figure out how to do all electric ventilation systems or, you know, this restaurant association, this town doesn't want it. And then, so some cities have completely banned it. Most cities have completely banned natural gas and have proven the point that this is doable at the entire city level for all building types. And then other cities have gotten most of the way there. But the thrust, the language, the thinking, the activism has grown. So this is the Natural Resource Defense Council and the Sierra Club both used to accept a lot of money from the natural gas industry and carry their water for them. That's changed, completely changed just in the last five years. So now the NRDC and the Sierra Club are listed as the opponents of the natural gas industry on the natural gas industry's formal like strategy document that they've posted online and they've mapped out who are their enemies, know your enemies, or just looking at a couple of days ago. It's changed. Wow. So um, yeah, I, I think that that has then, because Oakland is the home of, of our vice president, because the Bay Area has, has an outsized influence, it then got wrapped into the Green New Deal electrification in, in 2019. Like Berkeley passed their ordinance and then electrification got added as one of the platforms prior to the election. And then it's become what it once was, the clean energy uh, program, quote unquote. <clears throat> and this is what Ronald Reagan called it back in 53 through 63 when he was the official spokesperson for the electrification movement. And he was hired by 1300 utilities to help open up nuclear power plants and deliver clean energy to the grid. It's always been clean energy. Electricity paired with a clean grid is clean energy. And that's still Biden's clean energy program is electrification plus renewable energy in the grid. It, as you're talking, uh, just a personal anecdote, my neighbor used to work for the natural gas company or old neighbor in Portland. And you'd be surprised, you probably wouldn't be, at how often they would get called out to go stop a major potential leak and blow up uh, in the Pearl in a fluent neighborhood yeah. in Portland, a building that blew up. Uh, I, I believe in like 2018, downtown. <laughs> it, it was, you know, 2017 was a tragic year. That summer, I had an explosive gas leak in my front yard that we discovered. Like PGE came by and discovered that my yard was hot with methane gas because there was a leak at the juncture to my pipe. And then if someone threw a cigarette butt at my yard, my house might blow up for real. And that they spent two months before they came out and fixed it. And during that two months, I electrified everything I hadn't yet. Like I'd already gotten my heat pump in in 2009. I'd already gotten my heat pump water heater in. I'd gotten an electric dryer, et cetera. But I still hadn't worked on one of the water heaters. That was it. And then, so I got my house electrified. And then only a couple months later, my mother-in-law dies in the first of the well-known tubs, the tub fire in Santa Rosa. That first big one. I was like, holy moly, California's on fire. Santa Rosa is a big city. It's like, yeah, my mother-in-law died in that stuff. Wow. You know, it's like, that's, that really makes you sweat it at the end of the year, thinking like your whole family almost blew up and your mother-in-law is dead because of a climate change fire and you're going to her funeral soon. And that was upsetting. That was one of the reasons why in 2018 and 2019, I started getting impatient, impatient with this nonsense. There was too much death. You know, the, the, the next year in 2018, when paradise burned and like 80 something people died in flames, one of those little girls that escaped, she moved in like just around the corner and became my daughter, my, my kid's best friend. And so she'd come over and talk about what it was like. It was like an eight-year-old driving past cars where people were being burned alive in them on the side of the road. I'm just like, it, it, that's, that's a little, that's too much to handle emotionally if you're just sort of, if you imagine things. Right. 
so um yeah <laughs> california's been moving faster because it's a life-threatening problem to have methane either or like my, my sister-in-law and my brother they just moved out of new york city a year ago because of covid they moved to arcata the people were dying in their community they lived in a part of New York City that had very low uh, mask observance rate. And so there was refrigerator trucks on the street full of dead bodies. So they fled. Their apartment building had a house of one of the condos up there where um, just a few months ago, someone was turning on their gas stove and gas had already built up through a leak in the apartment and they blew up. And that, that person, I'm not clear if they're dead because they were in an induced coma, but the entire building then had an explosion in it. All the fire splinters turned on in everyone's apartments. Everyone was had tons of water damage. The gas is still turned off and we're heading into winter. And this is over one person in an apartment complex having a small gas problem that becomes everyone's crisis and everyone wants to move out of the building. The real estate is trash. I mean, they have water damage in all the walls, all the floors. So yeah, I think that's a, it's a, like having gas in a building is a high risk, low reward experience. Before we get back into this episode, I want to do a quick interruption to highlight the work that makes this podcast possible. The heartbeat of regenerative real estate is the incredible people that are focused on redefining our culture's relationship to place. From Latitude's growing ecosystem of mission aligned businesses and organizations, to our community of real estate professionals that are best described as change agents. The work we are doing at Latitude is focused on transforming the built and natural environments so that people and planet can thrive together. Here's a short message from Latitude change agent, Mark Voss out of Madison, Wisconsin. Through our search, we um, we look at conventional properties and we imagine together what they can become and how they can be, as they slowly evolve into a more regenerative property, what that does for their neighbors and for their neighborhood and for their community as being an example of how a conventional property can become a productive property to go from consumptive and extractive to productive and nourishing. Sean, I'm, you've delivered, you've helped to deliver 10, 10, over 10,000 units that are zero net. And I'm curious, how might we focus on the existing infrastructure of the built environment to transition that away from natural gas mm -hmm. and not just focus? I mean, it's great that we can focus policy on all new developments going forward from 2022. Um, but what do you think is going to do it to to hit the other 90% of the built environment? Well, there's a lot of different ways that people have explored doing it voluntarily. And um, we are in the same way that coal was banned, wood stoves in California, you can't put a wood stove in. Um, you, can't, <laughs> you can't use oil you know, for heating systems in your, in your homes in California the way you can on the East Coast. There's a whole bunch of systems you can't use in different parts of the country because of history has happened. People have moved away from using coal, is a good example, in their house. CARB, the California Air Resources Board, has been directed by the governor to figure out how we could electrify our state by 2035 and have completely clean, 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 <laughs> clean energy. So we have a 2035 goal in California, and the Air Resources Board, which is the equivalent of the EPA, it precedes the EPA, actually, and so it has its own regulatory authority. Hence why California kind of gets to make its own rules because we had the first building codes in San Francisco and LA and we had the first energy codes. And we also have the first Clean Air Act that precedes the federal government's Clean Air Act, which is how we've been able to require electric vehicles as a percentage of the cars sold. And that's CARB, California Air Resources Board. So they've been holding hearings for the last few months in which they're going to no longer allow the sale of gas devices for retrofits starting in 2026 and it goes through different industries, be it the ports or the trains or large commercial buildings or single family residences, cement manufacturers, all of them have a date that's being established right now in public hearings so that everything is phased out by 2035. How to pay for that 
I'm in meetings nonstop as we talk about what role the utilities will play because electric utilities can make a lot of money off of selling more electricity. The municipal utilities, particularly where it actually goes into city coffers, they're very um, aggressive. So SMUD, they got like a $40 billion bond, which they think they'll get paid off within 14 years. It's a 40 year-ish bond, but 14 years later, that's paid for itself in electricity sales. So they're thinking this is terrific. They're going to make a bunch of money off of electrifying all of PG&E's gas in the city and the city's electric utility now gets to make the money. So we're thinking, well, electric utilities, they have bonding authority. They can go get the money and they make the money back. So it's one strong strategy is to work with electric utilities and increase their share of sales and, and just have it be priced so that they recoup it within a reasonable period for the sake of their bond. That's a good one. Um, Block Power out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, that for-profit has been funded by a lot of private equity, big investors, and they just got hired by the city of Ithaca. And in Ithaca, New York, Cor Cornell's hometown, um, the way they're approaching it is they've gotten a whole bunch of monies to buy down the interest rate of loaning money to people personally with no, um, what is it, not unsecured loans. So it's essentially a low to no interest unsecured loan and the monies that the city has raised from NYSERDA, the New York um, Energy Organization, what it's doing is paying off the risk of not payment. That's how the interest rate goes down. They're saying, we'll be responsible for non-payment. People don't pay back their bills. That's what this chunk of money over here is for. So now you don't have to worry about that. Your interest rate can be low, no, and you can have unsecured loans. That's how Ithaca is going to do it. And there's, there's an advantage there because utilities are heavily regulated and the private investment market is wild, wild west, as we so frequently see. So they can raise a ton of money. Private market can also raise huge amounts of money as long as they get a return on investment. And this, this idea of having them get their return, but just um, make sure they don't have to face risk so that their return on investment doesn't include risk payments. You know, they're not making money off of the risk part of it, they're making money off of the genuine profit. So just give them the profit, we'll take risk. And, and this whole situation will be lower cost that way. So those are two strong strategies I see, or three, because California Air Resources Board is just simply gonna not allow them to be sold the way that so many other devices in our country eventually get regulated out of existence because they're too dangerous or they don't make sense for the context of our era. That's, that's what I see. So with, are you, are you saying the focus should be uh, on solar through that or through a myriad of, of technological solutions or, or applications that, that can go on? I think that the, the big move comes when the governments say, thou shalt not sell this stuff. That's the first one. So California Air Resources Board is doing their regulatory um, work this year because the EPA is doing their work next year. And they're going to just in so many ways in which California creates the policies for our country as, you know, has almost as much money as the entire federal government devoted to energy research. It's like its own Department of Energy, huge amounts of grants and tons of new products getting developed. It's it's its own world here. One in 10 Americans live in California, you know. So the Air Resources Board makes their moves this year. EPA makes their moves next year. And then when we announce the end of various appliances being sold into buildings, then we just need to make sure that those replacements are there, that they're cost effective one way or another, that it makes financial sense for people to do it. And there's a lot of emphasis on targeting low-income households first. And because um, they're usually easy. It's like, it's a whole apartment complex. So you can just do it all at once. You don't have to go to individual homeowners and argue with each person about whether or not they want to have this induction stove or another. Oh, you have 60 households. You can just do it. You own the whole building. They live there, you know? <laughs> so the strategy of going to multifamily housing, which is about 40% of America's housing first, that's a strong strategy, just thinking it through. Sophisticated owners, people have access, permission slips. Then. I think I'll pause there. That, that, that is 
the basic strategy. We have the, the government's announced end dates, and then we have financing in place to make sure that everyone can do it reasonably quickly. Where do you fall, Sean, on, on more of the, the shadow side of solar that people will bring up the objections that it takes a lot of mining and energy and what do you do with the panels after their, their useful life? Like what, what would you, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not looking for oh, the yeah. argument. It's just like your thoughts. No, yeah, it. It's a fair, everything has an environmental impact. So the, the argument of reusing things is so important, but that usually works for buildings. Right now, we have like a life or death choice between what does it look like to live in a super hot world where your family members die in wildfires, or we could have a cooler world. And the um, solar panels, they have a carbon intensity, like they contribute to climate change, the manufacturing of them. So there's always arguments for efficiency as opposed to generation still, but solar panels, recoup their carbon investment within one to three years of their 25 year warrantied lifespan. You know, Wall Street insisted that the warranties for um, the warranties for solar panels be at least 25 years and the inverter warranties. So they would have grade A investment stock. So if you have a one to three year um, payback of the carbon intensity over a 25 year lifespan that's warrantied, then you're doing what we need to do, which is rapidly decarbonize our energy and knowing that it will still cause pollution to, uh, to affect that change, it's just less. I mean, we've already lost the world that I grew up in and you grew up in. Climate change started to really kick in in the 2000s, but by 2009, California was seeing heat waves that were unprecedented. And then by 2017, we we're seeing wildfires that, had, that blew everyone's mind and killed tons of people. So yeah, solar has issues. Um, their issues are just much, much less than other kinds of energy. Wind power has issues. They're just so much less. You know, the, the, the killing of some birds versus the wholesale burning down of tens of thousands of acres of forest where birds live. <laughs> it's just different in scale of the problem. It's not that it isn't a problem, but it's just so much less of a problem. Yeah. And, and being a practical person, we have to embrace what we can do. Well, Sean, what, what a fascinating perspective and in the work that you do, I'm very appreciative of, of your time today, just to, to understand that there's somebody that is very passionate and very knowledgeable in this space that can help give reason and rationality and, and guidance during uh, a time where we're, I think a lot of people are looking for like, how do we get ourselves out of this huge clusterfuck that we find ourselves in. Yeah, um, we have books. I, I, as a science teacher, my first career, um, we've been writing books with five of them that are free downloads on our website. So redwoodenergy.net. And you can just grab the book on how to electrify a commercial building, how to electrify a multifamily or a single family, both new construction and retrofits, cold climates, warm climates, all the products that are available, just come grab it. It's, it's for, de for designers and developers. That's, that's who we made it for. So it's, if you're one of those people, this is a resource where it's very, it's pictures, lots of case studies, and, and really like a, it's a pocket guide. Like if you study birds, you wanna know all the birds that are in the woods, it's like that. This is all the heat pumps that are for sale that do you know, super cold climates. Here's all the water heater heat pumps. It's just the stuff so you can make informed decisions. Yeah. So, yeah. Redwood Energy. Everybody will yeah. also put that in our show notes. Show yeah, notes yeah. Is good. So, uh, Sean, I know you've got to get off to make some kiddos lunch. And uh, again, just thank you for the work that you're doing and, and the uh, opportunity to get to share that with our audience. Uh, it's okay. Been it was a pleasure. Here's the one I'm going to go make lunch for. Hi. Have a good lunch. Bye. Take care. <laughs> Thanks for the interview. Yeah, you're so sweet. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Okay, everyone, that is a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning in to another great episode. If you're not already a subscriber, please do so wherever you get your podcast. You can create good karma by leaving a review on Apple Podcast or sharing this show with your friends. If you're looking for ways to get more involved in the regenerative real estate movement, then you are in luck. We have a Facebook community conveniently 
called Regenerative Real Estate that you can join and be a co-creator with us on this journey. If you have a business or organization that you feel is aligned with our mission to use real estate as the catalyst for a regenerative future and would like to work together, then please be sure to get in touch. We are building an ecosystem to help amplify your work and message where you can present to our community or sponsor the work that we are doing. You can do this by reaching out to us at team at choose Last and certainly not least, this podcast is enabled by the people that buy and sell real estate with us through our network of latitude regenerative change agents located across North America. Our goal is to help transform homes and habitats person by person, property by property, And we do that by combining the skills of a real estate professional with sustainable and regenerative consultation. It is time that we all start to live our values and we hope to work with you on your next real estate sale or purchase. Okay, that is all for now. In the words of Paul Hawkins, remember that we are either stealing our future or healing our future. We are hard at work trying to do the latter. So until next time, Be well.